Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, can you all hear me? Is that a, okay? Good. Um, uh, just one. I don't. I'm, don't want to correct Carol, but uh, the steps are not actually underground, um, but we'll talk about that. Um, they do hold the building up, or a good part of it. Um, so, uh, let me see. Um, I, I, I always thought that this was March 3rd, 1911, was the saddest day in the history of the New York Public Library. Uh, a couple of months before it was opened, one of the architects, John Carrere, died in a, in a car accident, a taxi accident. He was hit by a, a, a trolley. Um, and so the city, because of his great contribution to the building of the library, decided that they would allow that the library be open ahead of time. 2,000 people came to visit, and here are the pallbearers carrying, carrying him out. Um, these were the, his colleagues from his office. Um, but but it was a, it was a the sort of first event at the New York Public Library, and and sadly now it seems that other things will be carried out of the library soon. Um, many books, millions of books, in fact, and then eventually the steel structure that holds up the stacks that are really at the center of the library. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the problem the the issue of what the library is planning to do, although this is rather vague um, in some respects. Then I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the, the stacks and the library and the relationship of the stacks to the library and how the idea of it developed. Then a little bit about the, the stacks themselves. All of these things are, re are really innovations in the way libraries are, uh, were built. And so they're important from a historical standpoint. But I would argue also they're important from an, from an uh, artistic standpoint, from, from the standpoint of, of what makes this building uh, such an excellent object. Uh, then, uh, then I'd like to talk a little bit about alternatives, just um, what, in, in broad terms, what else might be done rather than what the, what the trustees seem intent on doing. Oh, wrong thing. This was March 3rd, 1911. I'm lucky to have this picture because, because Carrere's grandson is still alive and his great-granddaughter lives. Um, the plan, uh, as it's been described in public and in the press, and you might, um, if, you, if you want a fuller explanation of the plan and the controversy, there are a number of very good articles. Charles Peterson's article called Lions in Winter, which is in N plus one. Uh, you can find that online. Uh, there's an article by Scott Sherman in The Nation, also excellent. And then Caleb Crane, who has a blog covering anything that's been said on this subject, uh, can, can, um, you can find more information there. So I'm going to try and condense this into really uh, discussing the, the basic physical aspects of, of the plan, which is a little difficult because even though this has been underway as a plan since 2008, the library has never released any drawings of what they're planning to do. Um, and I am an architect, so it seems a little um, suspicious to me that uh, they would get so far and so deeply into a project and, and still claim that there are no drawings. Anyway, um, there, there are three buildings at, at, at the core of it involved. Um, there's the Mid-Manhattan branch, which is at 40th Street and 42nd Street, which is a lending library, like your neighborhood branch libraries. Books come and go, DVDs, all kinds of stuff, lots of public services. Um, it's a very heavily used library. And then Sybil, um, which was built in uh, the 90s for $100 million in the B. Altman building, which is in the science industry business and mm, uh, Science Industry Business Library, which is a theoretic, which is a research library. It's not a it's not a, um, a lending library. Anyway, the the idea is to take these two buildings and put them on the block for sale uh, to the tune of about a hundred million dollars a piece, and then to take that money and to take their functions and remove the stacks. This is a section through the reading room up here, and the stacks below. So you can see they are not underground. They're behind the narrow windows that you see on. On, uh, uh, in Bryant Park. Um, so, so that is all to be removed, and all the contents of that is to be removed, and, and the functions that go in those two buildings are, are to replace it. 
Now, the reason this is under consideration, the reason it's even possible, is what's happened uh, with the digitization of, of texts and books of all kinds. And, um, and this is a little more controversial because there was an idea in 2004 that Google said they were going to digitize everything and make that available widely. And the public library has participated in this, allowing Google to digitize their books. Um, but as it turns out, there, the, the courts have gotten involved and there are a lot of sticky issues about copyright that means that even if the books have been digitized, they can't necessarily be made available to everyone. And so this idea that the books could all go away and the text would all be available is not really realistic, at least at this point. But I'd like to argue that, that probably never will there come a time when a library doesn't need books. And if this continues to be a research library, then in fact, it's even more important that the unique materials, uh, which are a particular strength of this library, are kept ready at hand. So uh, the, the articles I cited earlier make, uh, uh, will elaborate on this, on this kind of issue. Um, but it does touch on the physical possibility of reducing the number of books in the library. So right now, um, uh, uh, there are three million books approximately in the stacks. And, and uh, uh, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong page here. Um, Um, uh, so, as, and, there, and there are many other books in the, in the branch libraries, of which there are 87 branch libraries. There are other research libraries around the, around the horn of, of Manhattan, uh, the Bronx, and I apologize for leaving Staten Island out, but it just doesn't fit on the map. Um, I guess the argument about the electronic books, digital books, is that, is that this is a... Um, force that is going to decentralize the availability of books. You all probably have a reader or a way of reading text at home. Uh, you can read online. Um, so you don't really need to go to the library for those services, um, which makes it even kind of more um, makes it even less logical to remove all the books from this central location, which excels at other things. Um, possibly uh, uh, finding ways of bringing digital services to the branches is a way that's more consonant with the logic of the internet and the availability of books electronically. Because in fact, you can go then to a place nearer to you to get the services that aren't available to you um, online. And there are some of those services besides um, books that are, are not, um, that are still under copyright. There are all kinds of databases and any of you who do research realize that there's, there's you know, uh, uh, um, proprietary databases that, that are only available if you are a, university, a member of a university community or if you're in the public library. Um, but a lot of these databases are not available in the branches um, and, and it, it would be a good alternative to uh, uh, this plan to, to have them in the branches rather than destroy the building in order to, in order to accommodate them. So let me... Um, here's a section through the whole building. So you were seeing a, a portion of that again. Um, uh, the stacks are here. Um, so back to where I was. Uh, the, the, in 2004, the library had 9 million books. Of the 9 million books, 5 million were at 42nd Street. Of those, 3 million books were in the stacks. Now you realize this, is, this building stretches for two blocks, so that doesn't look like very much, but it's a very long uh, section that looks like that. Um, uh, then there are 2 million books in New Jersey. And, and so um, uh, in addition to that, in the 80s, the library built under Bryant Park, and this is, this is the part that is actually underground, um, two layers of compact book storage. And so there is, 
a conveyor belt that takes the books back there into the regular system of the library. And then these shelves move back and forth so that, so that there's, ver there's no permanent space between the shelves. And, and this was built to, to hold 3.2 million books, but one level of it has never been activated. Um, and, and so uh, there, e even in this move to take the books take the books to New Jersey, there isn't a plan to activate the other, um, the other level, which seems curious to me. Um, now, the exterior of this building is a landmark, a New York City landmark, which is a kind of protection that means um, uh, these walls are unlikely to be messed with, although uh, Robert Darton, one of the trustees in, in a public meeting, uh, allowed us how it would be wonderful to have an opening, an entrance to the library from the Bryant Park side. As of now, they're, they're, they're ha they haven't really come public with a plan like that, and so the plan for the new uh, use of this space is that you come in on the 42nd Street entrance, which exists, which is, if you use the library, also very crowded already as it is, um, uh, but thereby protecting these walls from, from change. Um, this is out of order. That's the problem. Sorry. This looks dark from here. Can you all see this image? Um, so uh, this is the cover of Scientific American from when the library first opened. And it's a very useful way to see exactly, uh, at least in a mechanical way, what it is about the stacks at the public library that are so remarkable and efficient. Um, here is the basement level where the machines run the dumbwaiter that goes up through the entire building. Here's the reading room up at the top. And some of you will recognize the oak um, uh, bar that goes through the middle where the service desk is, where the books arrive. So having placed a call slip, um, which is something that's changed, but uh, uh, the people below who work in the stacks are alerted to the need for a book. Um, they, you can see that it was quite heavily peopled in the stacks, or at least in the imagination of Scientific American in 1911. And unfortunately, I think it's not uh, quite so well staffed now. In any event, you call for a book, somebody retrieves it, takes it to the dumbwaiter, and it comes up there and is delivered to you, um, in my experience, in five to 15 minutes sometimes with the peculiar things that I request. It takes a little longer because nobody's looked at the book and they have a harder time finding it at the back of the shelf. Um, so, so, and there are seven levels here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, plus the basement. And so just to clarify, the books that come in from Bryant Park come from over here and they come through here, get changed into the elevator and go up. Unfortunately, the Stacks is not a public place. It's quite a fascinating place. Um, uh, and so even if, and there is a move of foot to, la to, to uh, uh, achieve to get landmark status for the reading room, but that's not going to protect these stacks which are not open to the public and so therefore um, even less uh, um, likely to be given landmark status by the city. Um, the alternative to this um, very efficient system of book delivery is to take the books to this place in New Jersey, which is called Recap. Let's hope this is in order, which is called RECAP, which is a Research Collections and Preservation Consortium, uh, a, a facility that is run by Princeton, Columbia, and the New York Public Library, where already there are two million books because there are more books than the, than the library can hold, although if they open the, the space below Bryant Park, uh, there would be a lot less need for this. Anyway, what happens then, what the, the plan here, and, it wor and this is how it works now, is if you find a book and it's in recap, which it will say in the catalog, um, they will page it from recap and it will be brought to the library. And so what happens is it, go it comes out of these very highly mechanized um, barcoded boxes, gets taken to the loading dock, gets put on a truck, and goes from New Jersey to New York, about a 50 mile trip, it takes about an hour, and, and and the hope 
is that this will happen within 24 hours. But, but this is not how it's working now. It's, less than, it's, a lot long, it's often a lot longer than that, sometimes two or three days before you get a book. And, and of course, many scholars have pointed out that, that part of the use of the library is that you're in the library and you find a reference to another piece of material. And rather than being able to call for it in 10 minutes, it, you have to go home and wait for it to come in the next um, uh, bus load. Anyway, so, so this is, replay, this is uh, an idea of, of efficiency. <laughs> um, anyway, that's just a, a quick synopsis of what the plan is. And as I say, it, it's not really a fair description. There's a lot more complexity to it. And I would encourage you to read um, the various arguments. But I'm trying to stick to a, a discussion here about the physical qualities of the library and the architectural qualities of the fabric of the building. And, and so now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, about how this library came to be organized in the way it was. Um, uh, as I'm sure you know, the library came into existence as a merger of some money from uh, Samuel Tilton uh, um, and two libraries. Uh, uh, um, the Aspen Library and the Lennox Library, which were brought together and their, their various assets brought together and, and um, uh, then there was an endeavor to build this new library uh, at the city's expense, by the way, for $9 million. Um, so in, in 1896, the trustees searched high and low and these were um, uh, uh, cultural leaders, businessmen, um, who didn't? Who were used to doing things in very in the right way? They wanted a great library, so they looked around to find, really, a, a person uniquely suited to uh, um, this enterprise. Uh, this man named John Shaw Billings. This is his portrait by Cecilia Bow, the kind of society portraitist of the time. Uh, he was a surgeon, but the red on his gown is not blood. It's from his Oxford uh, honorary degree. Um, so, so Billings was a brilliant man. Uh, uh, he had a fantastically long career. He knew everybody in science, many leaders in government, um, technologists. Uh, his interests were wide ranging, but he was a surgeon and, and so trained uh, just before the Civil War in Ohio as a doctor. Um, he went to work in the, uh, for the Army of the Potomac um, as a, looking after hospitals and sanitation. And then he stayed on in the Surgeon General's office after that in Washington, organizing the, the Army's medical library. Um, and he was remarkably efficient at this um, and developed something called the, the uh, Index Medica and then another uh, index of all of the material, printed material about medicine in the United States um, and then eventually encompassing other things. And, it, and so this made it possible for this explosion of knowledge and, and publication to be understood and found by people instead of having to randomly find it in magazines. It was, it was uh, um, uh, efficiently organized in a in catalog. So, um, uh, he continued on, and, 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 and this library was in Ford's Theater, where Lincoln was shot, which was a decrepit, falling down building. And uh, uh, eventually, he persuaded the Congress um, uh, to, build a new, uh, to build a new building. Uh, this is uh, the, the Army Medical Library and Museum. Uh, it, it was located on the mall where the Hirshhorn Museum is now. Uh, and, and designed by Adolf Kluse, an architect who did quite a lot of work in Washington, um, built in 1887. Uh, and, and this was built uh, by a contractor, but the, the project was overseen uh, by General Casey, who was head of the Corps of Engineers and a kind of remarkable person in his own right. Um, so so uh, Billings fancied himself an architect, and if you believe his biographers, um, he drew all of the things he ever was involved with, and some poor architect just drew, just kind of uh, made his sketches readable. But we'll look at something later that might give you a different view of that. And so again, uh, Shaw claimed, uh, uh, or or his biographers claimed, uh, uh, that he designed this building, and, and um, Schluss just 
kind of made it happen. And, and it's just plainly not true. Um, but what he did do is took charge of the library. And this was at the top of one pavilion of that building I just showed you. And remarkably, this um, uh, multi-story iron self-supporting stacks with an elevator here for the books. So you would go up the stairs and find your books and put them in the elevator and go down. Or more, more likely, the librarian would. Um, again, and another, uh, other issues that, that Billings was, oh, he wrote books on, on hygiene, on ventilation, um, and was very concerned in nat with natural light. And so, so the, you can't probably see this, but the decks here are perforated metal so that the light can penetrate down. Well, it didn't work out quite that well. And, and the story is that it really never worked until somebody invented the flashlight to go along with this building. Um, uh, in any case, uh, um, he, he, he was, this was really the physical manifestation of Billings' concern with, with organizing books and information to make them accessible to a much wider group of people than they would be if they, if they weren't so organized. But also interested in, in how to, I mean, you can see this is, not, this is nothing like the New York Public Library in terms of its embellishment. Um, it's really a fairly bare bones uh, building that evidently had had a little bit of central heating, but was almost uninhabitable uh, on a cold day in the Washington winter. Um, so um, how did they get that done? Uh, there was a company called Phoenix Ironworks in Trenton that was doing work for the, for the government building lighthouses. And they were especially good at doing um, prefabricated iron. So they would make the part, assemble the lighthouse in Trenton, disassemble it, and send it off to West or wherever they, they were building the lighthouse. Um, and, and so similarly, this is made of parts, repeatable parts, that in the 19th century was not an unknown technology, but, but there were a lot of new experiments with it um, uh, in the 1880s. And, and it was especially not an unknown um, uh, thing in, in Europe. This is the Bibliothèque National in Paris, uh, and uh, um, by Henry uh, Henri Le uh, Here's the famous reading room, but less famous is, and that's the reading room right here. Less famous is the magazine, the stacks, um, made out of iron, self-supporting in three stories, just like Casey's, um, uh, repeatable parts, uh, um, bolted together, um, and and so that's in 1868. This is Louis Napoleon's period, um, and. And so uh, there, there, were, uh, there were other experiments in Europe uh, um, and other experiments in the United States. Uh, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, there was an explosion of books. And so uh, libraries were on everybody's mind as a problem. In Boston, uh, uh, McKinmead and White uh, built the uh, Boston Public Library based on another Henri Le Brust library, uh, the Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve. But um, unlike uh, Le Brust, the, it did not have, which that library had books all around and stacks below on one level. This building has stacks right back here. The reading room is here. And so a visitor comes up the very grand stairs, if you've ever visited, would come into this room and request his books there. They would be uh, taken from the back. This was a, um, uh, the construction of this building was kind of a battle between the committees and him and everybody else involved. Uh, there's a very good essay by William Jordy that goes over that and actually talks in some, at some length about, about libraries and the context of this building. But the, the, the Boston Public Library had a previous library with a previous librarian who became quite celebrated, um, a, a, name, a man named Justin Windsor. Uh, and he said about this building, um, planned, it said about this building that it was planned to produce the largest instead of the smallest average distance of books from the point of delivery. And you can, <laughs> and, and so you, you start to see that the, it, it wasn't just Billings who had it on his mind, that we have this explosion of books, there are going to be so many of them, and we need to find not just a way to store them, but a way to retrieve them that is efficient. Um, so, so this idea, and by the way, there, there aren't uh, uh, multi-story iron stacks in the, in the Boston Public Library. They're just book rooms back there. Maybe there are now, but there weren't in the original uh, uh, construction. And so now we come to uh, 
a, a, a New Yorker, um, the a founder of the architecture school at Columbia, the founder of the architecture school at MIT, in fact, the two earliest, uh, MIT being the earliest uh, architecture school in the United States. Uh, William Robert Ware, um, who was educated at Harvard and Lawrence Scientific School, which was the kind of non uh, um, uh, classical uh, uh, branch of Harvard where technical subjects were, were taught. And, and uh, he had a job to, to build uh, a multi story stacks addition to Gore Hall at, at Harvard. And so here's the old Gothic building behind, and then here's the one, two, three, four, five, six, and supporting the ceiling, iron stacks that, that Ware and his partner Van Brunt devised uh, in the 1870s. And um, not content to show us this, um, he's shown us a, a isometric uh, drawing showing the various parts, which again are cast and then bolted in place in a repeating way um, to make uh, a, a very efficient uh, and, and well ventilated uh, stack system. And um, uh, one, one criticism of this system from, from Billings' point of view was that the shelves were made out of wood. And so the, the other uh, issue for all of these folks was ha uh, having a fireproof place to keep the books. Anyway, um, where uh, being in New York, being uh, uh, the first person really uh, to architect to do this multi-story stack, stack system in the United States uh, um, was the logical person he was going to call on as an advisor for his, um, uh, for his new library plan. Um, uh, there's another man, Bernard Richardson Green, also educated at Harvard, also a New England man, um, someone who worked for General Casey. He was, n he was not uh, in the Army, but he was a, a high up civilian in the Corps of Engineers, and he spent virtually his entire career working for Casey on various projects, one of which was um, uh, the, the completion of the Washington Monument, which, as you know, Washington, unlike New York being built on bedrock, Washington is built on a swamp, and so they got a certain way up uh, with the Washington Monument, and it started to list a little bit. And so t time went along, and they had to figure out a new um, foundation system, which, which uh, Green helped on. And then uh, what he's uh, uh, really uh, deeply involved in is the Pyramidian at the top of the uh, Washington Monument. And of course, this building couldn't be, it, it looks like it's solid masonry, and it is going up. But as they got to the top, they, could, they had to make it as light as they possibly could. And so this is really a stone. Uh, I hesitate to call it a curtain wall, but it is stone that is supported on iron. So you see the ironwork inside, um, and then this thin layer of stone at the very top. And then at the very top, uh, there is the, uh, the, the very uh, point of it is, is cast aluminum, quite a, a, a not a usually used material in that time. And, and if there's any doubt about Green's importance in this project, his is one of the names that's inscribed on the top of, of, in the, of the aluminum, which has now been messed around with because of, of uh, uh, the earthquake and various other um, problems that they've had over time because it, it's built on a swamp. But uh, Casey was also in charge of building the Library of Congress, um, another great library project proceed, immediately preceding the New York Public Library, wherein there are these big wings of stacks. And now there are many more than that. But, um, uh, but Green was put in charge of the stacks. And so, so what Green decided to do was design a stacks and have a model, a full-scale model made um, so that it could be tested and changed and fixed because they were building an awful lot of them. Um, and, and so he did. So, so as the time came to find another advisor, Green was hired. Now, of course, Green had been working for Casey when Billings built the Army uh, Library and Museum. And so they weren't strangers, in fact, um, I, I haven't been able to uh, make the link, but it seems entirely possible to me that, that Green was the one who took Casey's idea of the stacks and made it into drawings that could be um, built by the Phoenix uh, um, Ironworks in Trenton. So um, uh, this, is the, this is the drawing that proves uh, what a great architect Billings is. 
Um, and, and it's sort of the magna carta, it's the foundation document of the New York Public Library, and I'm joking a little bit because I, it's a very crude drawing, but I'll show you later how, how carefully followed it was. And, and, um, but th they, they had to organize this system so that it would be fair and open, or at least that was the goal. And, and so, of course, where um, one of the advisors was particularly well suited for this because he had been, in, he was involved with, he was an architect, but he really wasn't practicing at this point. He was, uh, he was teaching, uh, um, highly, res high, highly respected by all of his um, colleagues. And he was working on what are the rules, and this was in the air really, or not in the air, this was in the profession, about how do you run a competition? What's a fair way to run a competition? There'd just been an act uh, uh, passed by Congress called the Tarnsey Act uh, in the early 90s that was going to make it possible for uh, public buildings to be built by competition among architects. And this was the architects thought it was terrific, but the government w wasn't, wasn't implementing that law, even though it had passed, nobody was doing anything about it. And so everybody was thinking about competitions. And in fact, the Society of Beaux-Arts Ar Architects, those sympathetic with the Beaux-Arts system and trained at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, um, had, had circulated a letter say, uh, which, which, said, which had been signed by all the prominent architects in New York saying, we will only participate in a competition for a public building under these circumstances. And they laid out that they added a, a professional advisor. Well, there was where, so isn't that convenient. Um, uh, they, they wanted to know who the jury was. There had to be a program ahead of time. It had to be paid. Um, there, there had to be a sort of business plan of how they were going to implement the competition once it was done. Um, so, so as Billings is thinking about what's the physical arrangement of the building, he's also thinking about how are they going to organize this competition. And so, um, uh, and, and where uh, had, had um, uh, opinions on this subject. Uh, so not very long after the competition for the public library, he gave a big talk in front of the AIA uh, in, uh, uh, I think, 1898 or 99, um, and said, in the case of public work, also, it may be considered impolitic or improper as having the color of favoritism to appoint an architect outright. A competition of some sort is considered inevitable, and it must be accepted with all its disadvantages. And of course, he, this was a long paper, um, and, and he, he outlined all of the disadvantages and all of the advantages of, of uh, competitions for public buildings. Uh, in any case, they determined to have a competition, but they, the, the architects who had signed this letter said they would not participate in a competition that wasn't, um, that was, uh, uh, that was open and that wasn't paid at a certain level. But they wanted to be able to include everyone. So they had a two-stage competition, which worked out just fine for Billings because it meant he could, he could make a program that, that put out this diagram. And of course, Ware helped him turn it into something that could be read, and I'll help you later uh, uh, with that. But um, so they had a two-stage competition. One open to anybody who wanted to enter. Um, uh, and, then, and then once that was settled, they would pick the best of that group and, and have and pay a, a much higher amount you know, for anybody entering to six architects who were well known. And, and um, so the, the first level was kind of trying this out on the kids who weren't so prominent and just wanted to enter. Um, uh, and for that, the, uh, oh dear, I've got, got ahead of myself here. Uh, uh, and so, and for the judge, the judges for that were not architects. It was simply Billings, Ware, and Green. So it was, you know, it was an engineer, and I guess Ware is an architect, and, and Green. But nobody appointed or, or delegated by the co competitors. And, and every, everybody was satisfied. It went fine. They picked a couple of winners, and they were very happy to have included the, what they said the young men of New York. And there were even people from outside New York who entered. Um, anyhow, there was a second stage. Uh, it included all the big guns, McKim, Mead, and White, um, uh, uh, Post, Career and Hastings, and Career and Hastings won. And here are our, our guys um, uh, uh, John Mervyn Career, whose um, coffin I showed you earlier, and Thomas Hastings, who lived on and on uh, till 1929. Uh, they were uh, both trained uh, in the Beaux Arts and both. Uh, worked in McKim Eden White's office. So, um, so in the course of this competition, though, McKim 
taking this idea that a diagram being imposed by a librarian um, was really beneath the dignity of an architect, said, I'm not going to participate. And finally they decided, and Billings didn't want to give any ground either, but they couldn't have the most prominent architect in New York not participate in this competition. So telegrams were exchanged and finally uh, um, uh, Billings got McKim to participate with the proviso that they just, it was like working at the UN or something. They, they worked out the language so that it, everybody could interpret it to mean whatever they wanted. And McKim could interpret it to mean he didn't have to follow Billings' diagram, which actually Billings' diagram makes quite a lot of sense, especially in light of his work at the New York Public Library. Anyway, Billings, very worried about this whole thing, said uh, uh, after McKim had accepted his invitation, and he's off on somebody's yacht, you know, for the summer. Uh, um, so they're cabling back and forth. Uh, says, says about Mickey Mead and White, they're, they're queer people, and I want to put them in the position where they can't retreat. Therefore, put the announcement in the papers as soon as possible. And so, so you know, the secretary went and rushed into the papers that McKim had agreed to participate and to no, to no avail. Um, Uh, incidentally, Carrer always said, and who was, had opinions about, about uh, um, competitions too, always said that his big preference was to have a client like Billings who knew exactly what he wanted, who laid out in basic terms exactly what he wanted so that the architect's job was to find a way to organize it in an elegant way. So here's Billings' diagram, and here are the plans that Carrer and, and Hastings, um, that, that it, these are not the winning uh, competition drawings because the building plan evolved, but it's very close to it. And you can see that here's Billings' idea is that there is a reading room uh, with stacks below with a vertical element that will, like an elevator, that will get the books up and down and bring them there. There are light courts here and here and open back there so that, and of course he's got dimensions all over the place which are, are were more or less followed, I mean not exactly, but closely. Um, so that there would be light into the stacks here, light into the stacks there, and, and in fact, light from the reading room there. And so that's, that's what you've got is, here's the reading room, windows on both sides, central element to bring the books up and down, and then stacks below. But of course, these are just plans, and the, and the uh, remarkable thing about this building is, is I mean, a, a, the plan is, is sufficiently remarkable, but the, but the, the sort of three-dimensional complexity of it is really something. There we are. Um, now, this is not Frank Gehry's remodeling of the New York Public Library. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a very good diagram uh, that shows as though you cut away parts of the library and it's very useful as a way of showing just how complex as a three-dimensional idea um, it is and just how interesting, I, I assume most of you have been to the library but I'm just gonna kind of quickly walk you through that, that from Fifth Avenue you go up some steps and up some more steps and then through the door. Well, well what, the, the challenge here is to get you up seven stories to the top of a pile of books that's seven stories tall. And there's the pile of books. And the challenge is to do that in such a way that you enjoy it, that it's a pleasant experience, that it enhances the, the um, sort of spatial experience of the building. And in fact, that it builds up to this fantastic room, which is in a certain way at the top of the world in New York. So you come up there, then turn, and, and, and there's this beautiful, call it the lobby, they call it the rotunda, although it is not round, um, up some stairs there, and then, then we're cut off, and you can't see where the stairs are going up, but they come up into another room they call a rotunda that is not round, um, into the catalog room, well, you know, it's funny, I, for years I was reading about career body lying and stayed in the rotunda, and I thought, well, did they mean there, or, or did they mean there? And it wasn't until I got those photographs where they actually show it down there that I knew what they were talking about, since neither room is round. Anyway, um, uh, you pass through catalog room, which in the old days is where you, pay, you know, found what book you wanted and paged it, and then come into this remarkable room at the top of the world. All the while, you know, the mechanics of this are beneath you, uh, ready to serve up the books that, that you've asked for. Um, um, and, and 
if you, if you aren't familiar with it or you haven't been there, there, there is the reading room. And in fact, here are the stairs um, up John Stuart Kennedy. This little memorial was designed by Carrere and Hastings. And then there's another one out of the picture of Hastings. And on the opposite wall, there's one of Carrere. Um, so you come up this great stair. And then this is looking back at the same thing, going, you know, going across the sort of mezzanine level of the building. And then again, here is the, where the books are delivered. So. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that's so uh, remarkable about this is that, that it's a, it's a f modern building in the sense that the function of the building, the way it actually works, it's a it's kind of a machine for reading in, um, enhances and is, is kind of tightly knit with the physical characteristics of the building. So as you rise up through this great structure, one fantastically decorated and embellished room after another, you arrive at really the grandest room of all, flooded with light. And there, these books are served up to you. The physical object of the book is served up to you. And once you realize, once you understand the building and realize that, that this is, they are solid, packed beneath you, that you're standing on these books, that the thing that is supporting them is supporting you. And and, and this whole mechanism, this whole kind of machine of invention and space has been, has been organized to deliver these books to you and give you a pleasant place to read them, um, it, it leaves you wondering what it will be like when they aren't books beneath you. Um, and, and of course, this is in uh, one's imagination in a way. Maybe it doesn't really matter that the books are coming from New Jersey. But it seems to me that, the, that this building, insofar as that architecture is a work of art, that wherein the function of the building is tied deeply with the fabric of the building, um, this is as good an example of that as we have in New York. The stacks aren't that simple, though. Um, uh, the way this building was made is, is drawings were made, um, and then first of all, they had, they had to, you know, I mean, there are many preliminary things, and the foundation was a terrific, uh, long, <coughs> took a lot longer to deal with than they thought. But, but there was a big uh, uh, contract let for the stone, for the marble. And so the marble wall started to go up here. Um, uh, and as that was going on, then they started to um, work on the bids for the, for the stacks. Um, just incidentally, I think you can see in the distance, that is uh, Hastings' father, Reverend Thomas Hastings' church, uh, which is about where the American Aeolian building is now. Um, and so, uh, so this was kind of familiar turf for, for uh, Hastings. Um, so so they, they made drawings and started to, to uh, uh, um, find contractors who could build the stacks for them. And, and the terms of the contract, uh, this sounds an awful lot like the Library of Congress, and obviously Bernard Green had a hand in it. Um, but the terms of it were that any competitor had to submit their bids at the arsenal and then provide a full-scale model of the, of the uh, stacks that they were proposing to do. And so these look very much alike, but, but this one is by a company called Hecla Ironworks out in Williamsburg. And this one is by Sneed and Company uh, uh, who, who were in Jersey City. Uh, there were other competitors, J.B. and J.M. Cornell, uh, a, a name familiar to anybody who paid attention to uh, foundry work that was done in New York from really uh, the time of Bogardus and the early cast iron fronts to, uh, uh, to the sort of uh, teens, I think. Uh, uh, Van Doren is iron as far away as Cleveland uh, uh, provided a bid. Uh, J, uh, F.J. Carlin, another Brooklyn Foundry uh, provided a bid, um, but these two are what we have. Uh, uh, interestingly, the the um, scrapbook from Hecla is in possession of the New York Public Library, so we have that. And and Sneed and Company published books on on uh, their uh, on their shelves. Uh, here is Hecla's uh, really remarkable. Um, uh, headquarters in Williamsburg. It was landmarked by the city in 2004 because this is not Cortan. It's an early version of, of uh, a steel process where the steel was steam cured so it wouldn't need to be painted. And here is the really remarkable vaulting that occurs on every floor made of iron with plaster insets. And, and so just to give you a, I mean, here's the, here's the ironwork from the Dakota 
Um, you can, if you really are a buff of New York architecture, you can probably pick out every single thing here. They, they, their work is all over the place, very important firm. Um, uh, but uh, Sneed maybe had a leg up on the job since uh, uh, they had worked with Green uh, on the New York Public Li or, I mean, on the Library of Congress. Um, uh, and, uh, and they had also built the stairs, on, uh, the iron stairs that went up the statue of uh, uh, the Washington Monument. So, so Green was no stranger to them. And in fact, Green, when he was working at the Library of Congress, um, had the uh, wit to patent all of the uh, developments he was making in, in um, steel shelving. And so here's a page from his patent. You can see... Uh, Bernard R. Green down there, and and this is his scheme for holding up the shelves with uh, um, with steel or iron uprights, so that there can be multi multi-story shelves. He also patented a way of making shelves with. Um, slots so that air could circulate through, and, and it's kind of like all in the 1890s, he's he's preparing the ground for uh, uh, the New York Public Library. Uh, now, Sneed uh, started out in Louisville, and there in 1898, their their factory burned down, so they decided to move to Jersey City, uh, just in time to participate in the construction of the New York Public Library. But they had they had developed this expertise with Green, and if you and their catalogs are are um, in, also in the New York Public, Public Library, written by Green in large part, full of his um, uh, uh, lists of his patents for various aspects of, of um, uh, uh, shelf construction. And they went on to build the shelves in uh, Harvard and uh, Berkeley and the Vatican and all over the place. And so at a certain period of time, any library uh, of any size is likely to have Sneed shelves. Oh, dear. Let's see, if, let's see if changing the slide makes any difference. And so, so um, uh, so it's no surprise that during this, uh, um, in this competition, that uh, Green sort of uh, Green and Sneed had kind of a leg up, and that didn't make Hecla the long-standing innovative New York founder very happy, uh, and so, so uh, uh, Heckla went to court in Brooklyn and sued because their, their bid had in fact been lower, and um, substantially lower. Um, and and the, the judge in Brooklyn threw it out and they decided to appeal. Finally, it, it you know, was holding everybody up because they were trying to, they, they weren't really able to go forward with the construction of the stacks. And, and uh, um, so they went to the uh, Corporation Council who wrote, a, you know, something th this many pages, uh, opinion about, about the stat, about who, what was, what was right and wrong, what the deal was for, for McClellan, who was head of the Board of Estimate and Mayor at the time. Um, uh, and took testimony, and so Career went and testified, and, and the question was, why, uh, uh, why would you not pick the lower, uh, uh, um, lower cost? Well, of course they weren't going to pick it because because Billings, the guy who was running the library, liked Green and this system, and that's what he really wanted. He didn't care what it cost. But, I mean, and but but Career, uh, putting putting it more diplomatically than that, said said, well, all of the experts and all of the architects agree on the efficiency of this system, and they weren't particularly different. But in the meantime, it, you know, it got in the papers that that uh, somebody from Heckler claimed that when they dropped off their bid at the Arsenal, that somebody had offered them seventy five or had offered to get them the job if they paid him seventy five thousand dollars. Nobody could come up with who that person was, and Heckler backed down from that. And then the Herald wrote a, wrote a story how, how there was graft at the public library and, and Billings, who was, uh, uh, um, among many things, um, a pretty, pretty upright, proper fellow who probably didn't like being called a grafter, um, had, had somebody from the library go and make them print a retraction. Um, anyway, in the, in the fullness of time, the, the, the mayor and, and the board of estimates decided that, in fact, if that's what the experts want, expert, experts and architects want, and they can, te and they'll testify that it's better for some reason, and nobody could really very easily tell that it was, um, uh, 
uh, in fact, Heckler said, though there, the, the Sneed one is no good because it has too many, too many holes where the roaches will gather. Uh, um, anyway, uh, 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 Sneed got the job and Green was happy and, and uh, Billings was happy and, and so it went ahead. And so this is, again, sort of from the same point of view, there's uh, Dr. Hast uh, Reverend Hastings Church again. So we're looking south towards 42nd Street, I'm sorry, north towards 42nd Street. And here are the steel, Carnegie steel, by the way, uprights um, uh, and the grid that, that is the superstructure that is not only holding the books, but in the shelves, but about holding the floor of the library uh, reading room above. And, and then, um, I don't know if any of you saw the great show at the uh, Museum of the City of New York called The Greatest Grid, um, but uh, this is the kind of three-dimensional manifestation of the city grid. But it's also really like the way the cage frames of uh, New York buildings at the time were being built, uh, just lighter. So here you see, this is the ceiling of the stacks, which is, is a, a tile vault, um, lightweight tile, to hold the floor of the reading room up above. Now on the sides, uh, which are out of this shot, they, they don't attach to the walls of the building. And in fact, Carrera and Hastings insisted in a couple of places that they attach and, and, and uh, uh, Sneed kind of uh, complained about it the whole time because the idea was that it was a freestanding thing um, wherein uh, um, air could circulate, um, wherein there were no, there was no wood, it was all either stone and there, and there are panels that you can see where the floor panels would fit in that's supported by the steel. But here you can see up and down. I mean, the, they're, they're not in yet. It's all the, all the ferrous metal. This is, so the uprights, which again, you can see here, are then hidden by these panels and integrated into the verticals of the building. Um, and then you, the, that's, that's this framework that's holding the, holding the stone. And then there's this little airspace. Again, Billings was, was sort of obsessed with air circulation. Um, so that so that the the air could circulate within the shelves because the the um, uh, shelves were were bars and then they the air could circulate from floor to floor um, so these are just this is just another drawing not of the public library but of another Sneed um, scheme where you can see see this whole multi floor scheme uh, worked out. Uh, We're at the Skyscraper Museum, and I mean to tie this into skyscrapers because really one of the things about New York buildings that is a kind of innovation, a characteristic of the city, and we could argue with Chicago a lot, but um, is the development of certain uh, elements of, of uh, uh, one of which is a curtain wall, which is a, 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 the wall of the building not built brick on top of brick, but hung from some kind of a structure. And so James Bogardus in the, in the 40s and 50s um, started to develop ideas of, of how, to, um, how to do that sort of thing. This is a shot tower, or I mean, this is a uh, fire tower up in uh, uh, Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem. And the white stuff is just stabilizing material to keep this together until somebody can come up with the money to fix it because there, there were these all over the city and some of them were quite tall. Um, but this one, since it's up on an eminent place, is not so tall, um, but it, it has all the ironwork, Bogardus ironwork intact. Um, and so these were open air structures as you see, but it, it had a, has a bell and a place for somebody to observe and see if there's a fire and ring the bell and warn the city. Um, so Bogardus, not far from his own shop, um, built another uh, building, maybe more remarkable because like the library, this is, these are iron, um, in the case of the library it's steel, but um, where in the infill panels are brick. And if you look carefully, you can see through the bottom because these brick walls are not being built on top of each other, but they're being built each time to infill the panel. So that brick wall would be held up by that bar. Another brick wall would be held up by another bar. And that is a very early version of a kind of curtain wall. So, so I don't mean to say that, so when Carol, the conversation we had, I said really it's just, it's just like, it's like a cage frame with curtain walls of books threaded through. And that is what the library is. It's, it's a, um, 
uh, the stacks uh, are, are all being supported by, by very thin elements, um, a frame like a skyscraper, where not the facade is being hung on it, not the uh, enclosure of the wall, but the content of the building. Ooh. Don't tell me. Uh oh. Oh, there we Ooh. I think I've gone too far. Yes. Nope, that's right. There we are. Um, and so, of course, the, the, the Bogardus buildings I was showing you are before, quite a lot before the library, and then uh, this quite a lot after, um, where, where um, uh, you see, though, this, this quintessentially New York idea of, of the steel frame uh, clothed uh, in this case, it's under construction, but you can see the tall buildings below in some fancy dress. And public library is a perfect example where there's maybe a worth gown uh, surrounding the frame. Um, uh, but again, Bogart has tried to patent his iron frame, and as Sneed did, rather successfully patent his. Um, and, and so there is this idea of, of interchangeable parts, uh, uh, multiply manufactured parts that are fit together to form a frame, and that's uh, uh, later on the, the kind of steel manufacturers started making manuals and, and uh, specific shapes with specific characteristics that they would publish so you knew what the characteristics of the, of the particular I-beam you were buying. Uh, and so it enabled the building of smaller and complex buildings. Um, in any case, uh, um, the, the library is not a thin wall building like these are. It's a thick wall building, but it has all the components, or it brings together, um, not as a commercial building, but as a civic building, it brings together these aspects of, of uh, New York architecture that, that um, it, as, a, as a composition with maybe higher aspirations than just a commercial building. Um, I think if we remove the books, we diminish that, that aspect of, of um, the building, and, and, and it doesn't seem necessary to me. In fact, highly undesirable. Um, so what is to be done about this? I, I think, there we are. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier about the possibility that, that instead of uh, uh, responding to the uh, ge geographical distribution of the internet and its possibilities um, by concentrating uh, the users in one place, that we find a way to, to um, uh, disperse the use of, uh, uh, the, disperse the sort of facilities that the library uh, produces around an already um, fairly robust and excellent um, network of branch libraries. Um, but also, there are other possibilities that the library itself has explored. This is an earlier um, scheme to remodel the mid Manhattan branch and add within the allowable airspace to it. Um, so as to leave this uh, library in place. And, and one of the um, articles I mentioned earlier suggests that, that the, the difficulties that the library throws up in front of this possibility, and it doesn't have to look like this. This is just Guafni's scheme and uh, uh, long, long gone, actually. Um, uh, but the problem is that they don't want to close this library and leave people without the service of the library for, for some period of time. Uh, and, and I think Charles Peterson suggests that, that they could use Sybil for a temporary library while this is being remodeled, if that's necessary. But I think that there are, there are other um, possibilities still. Um, uh, and, and I will just suggest, too, uh, w right in Midtown, uh, on the far west side, uh, at the top of the High Line, um, perhaps there could be a new branch library to answer the Whitney at the bottom of the High Line, or to bring some kind of cultural enrichment to these, this new very large development. Similarly, uh, just below the UN, on the east side, there's, a, uh, there's an empty site, which this is an early play, uh, idea about how that might be used. Any of these skyscraper sites actually need um, uh, ground level 
cultural enrichment, and and these are these are perfect sites for a new building. So the Mid Manhattan branch could be kept open until such time as as on one of these new sites, a new or two new lending libraries are established. Um, one of the impediments to this is that the city has has promised 150 million dollars to the to the renovation of the library, the plan that the that the trustees have proposed, and according to the trustees, they will not allow the 150 million dollars to be spent on anything else. Um, but 150 million dollars would go a long way to e either uh, uh, building a new branch or renovating the, the new Manhattan branch. So, um, uh, it seems to me that, that uh, Billings and Ware and Carrere and Hastings would demand a public process where what is planned is um, put forward in the public as drawings or that a competition is held so that so that everybody knows so that it's possible to have a have a conversation in the whole city among the owners of the building the public library uh, what it is to, uh, that must be done uh, that's what they would demand and so I suggest that's what we should demand and thank you Turn the air conditioning on, my God. I just I have a very, very short question. The first uh, image you have of buildings in the red room, is, he wearing a, is that a union uh, uniform as well? Yes. Oh no, he was in the he was in the army for a good part of his career, and so so he was wearing his his army uniform. But then he was wearing his Oxford gown from what, I don't know where he received his his honorary degree. Yeah. Where in New Jersey is the storage facility? It's outside of Princeton. It's um, Princeton has a sort of a campus on the other side of Lake Carnegie that's got these sprawling suburban like facilities. Um, it's there. Yes? Does anybody talk uh, in, in all the things that they're not saying? Are the trustees talking about the, or is there any open discussion of what the cost of renovating the library would be? Uh, last year, uh, they were promising to do, they bring in things from recap in two to four days. And now, the claim on the website, and I, it has been so in the past few weeks, uh, is that they will bring things in for recap. Uh, if you ask for it before 2.30 on day X, it will be X plus one there. Uh, and, and they've done that except when they bring the wrong volume, in which case. Uh, <laughs> I, that, that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that's not my point. My point is, and, and I accept your point about lack of spontaneity and being able to move on having made a discovery and then you wait 24 hours. That doesn't seem to me to be. But economically, all of this trucking, and not to mention in terms of global warming, uh, how many trucks filled with books in five years or 10 years are we going to have going on highways that make them take forever anyway uh, for no particular purpose? Well, the fellow's name was Bernard Green, uh, uh, so it's, I, I mean, I can't, it's a much more efficient system to keep his, you know, the Metropolitan Museum, for example, does not show all their paintings. In fact, some of them are in storage and some of them are in the museum, not visible. Um, that's a job of the curators. And, yeah, and, and so it's true that the, that the public library cannot keep all of its books in place, but that doesn't mean because they can't keep all of them there, you throw up your hand and say, we can't keep any of them here. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. The two issues that they have claimed are significant, and I, and I would like, since you've seen this down at the gallery, uh, one of them is air conditioning, which is fine. I find hard to believe they couldn't do it efficiently, but they claim it would be too much air conditioning, the stats as they exist. The other question I have is about retractable shelving within the existing stacks. I mean, that, that is one of the, the problems, is that the space may no longer be storing books efficiently. They're, they're, In terms of being able to, you know, on the lower, under the, the 
Park, I believe they have the textbooks. They do. And in modern libraries, that's a huge space in the But the, um, and, and you, I mean, you could rip out the steel structure that I've been talking about. No, no, I'm just saying it, it is possible to rip out the steel structure and install uh, movable shelves, but that's a, you know when you that's a that's a very big expense. Air conditioning is it, I don't I, nobody. One of the things that if you read uh, Charles Peterson's very extensive article, you'll you'll see that it it's very difficult to confront some of these questions because because like exactly how many books are going here or there, uh, it's hard to get a straight answer about that. Nobody's. Uh, this is a $350 million project. Air conditioning the stacks would, I don't care how elaborately and carefully it's done, it isn't gonna, isn't gonna come anywhere near that cost. And so, so there, there are decisions that have been made for where if there was a public process where everybody could openly discuss what the options are and if the options were brought forward because n nobody wants to talk about options. Um, it would, it would, there would be space for making the shelving more efficient in terms of? You can't put movable shelves without destroying the whole thing. I mean, which you can just, you know. That's right. They're only using 1.2, 1.2 million books downstairs in a, where there's capacity for three. And I think it's $40 million is the cost of activating that other, that other um, shelf. Yes, I, I gather in the early um, history, I, I have a vague recollection before they moved into Arnold Constable on 40th Street, that there was <coughs> lending in the main line. Yes, there was. In Goddess, in the Does that go back to the, to the very beginning? It does. It was, I believe it was to the where the children's library is to the right of the 42nd Street. Um, but it wasn't a very big thing. You're shaking your head. Oh, oh, that's, yes, that's right. Yes. Since the city is involved in contributing monies to this, have there been or will there be public review of this? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, first there have to be first there have to be drawings to review. And so Yes, they, they have they have approved 150 million dollars for this project, but the pro, but this is the kind of catch 22 for what pro, you know the project is described verbally you know it's never it's never described in drawings. Is supposed to mean money. <laughs> was it the council who approved or the mayor? Yes. No, the well, I think they both had to approve it. Oh. The mayor is behind it and Yes. Could I ask you um, on, on another topic altogether? You said this idea of the steel shelves or the steel uh, underpinning sheathed by um, some of the material in a building is a contestantly New York idea. And I always have thought of it as uh, Louis Sullivan's building in Chicago as being sort of the, the, the Chicago idea at the beginning of that kind of building. Yeah, it's a very long argument. <laughs> um, <laughs> but aspect, aspects, aspects, aspects of the frame, of frame construction and, and curtain wall building all, all skyscraper development. It's not, there are parts of it in New York, there are parts of it in Chicago, they're not that far away. There's a lot of conversation back and forth. But Carol would be the perfect person to, to, to feel the complexities of that uh, argument. Thank you. Yes? Who are the trustees and how are they selected? Oh, golly. Uh, I don't know. I think it's maybe self-perpetuating as a board. Uh, um, so there are trustees who are who are remarkable scholars like Robert Darton, um, and then there are trustees who are remarkable check writers. And I, I so um, I don't know I don't know how people are are I mean it's a it's a private Ely Mossenary 
uh, um, thing, but it's tied in the city because the city owns the building and a lot of the branches, most of the branches are, are funded by the city and I think a lot of them are owned by the city. So, so the branches are, are managed by the library, but they're not, uh, it's a very, you know, there's a lot of complexity there. And it may be that some of this, some of the issues here about where the money gets spent and how it gets spent have to do with niceties of finance that are way beyond my understanding. meant to be funding the operations of the library, and the library is meant to be funding the connections. However, they are not. <laughs> As of around building another team. Okay. Oh, yes? Um, there has been um, people uh, who are interested in having the staffs land more. Is there any official effort underway and is it too late anyway? Uh, one of my co-authors has been working on, on landmarking the reading room. I mentioned this. It's, it's open to the public. Um, it's, city landmarks are very rarely, interior landmarks are very, very rarely designated because, because preservation law in the United States is it's kind of about police power on the street and so they don't want to get mixed up with, with really undermining the law by overreaching in interiors. And it is possible that the, that the reading room could be landmark. But since the stacks are not open to the public and have never been open to the public, that's one of the really big criteria that would, would mitigate against it being possible. But the Customs House within the, uh, the National Museum of American Indians located have interior spaces which cannot be... I know, I, it, it can be done. It's just, ra it's rarely done and it's never done for spaces that are not and open to the public. Is a national landmark as well as mm -hmm. landmark. But that, so, that, the national landmarks afford very little actual legal protection. So I think the time has come to ask questions individually and fans aside and join us for... And turn on the air, con and turn on the air conditioning. And we do, I will. Um, and we, we do have two sets of books here to anybody want to thank um, Chip for his scholarship by supporting his scholarship. <laughs>